Hello and welcome to our Spring 2015 Digital Photography Lecture Series. We are thrilled to have photographer Valerio Spada as tonight's guest speaker. Uh, Valerio attended Milan's Istituto Italiano de Fotografia, where he graduated with an MFA in photography. In 2011, his first self-published book, Gomorrah Girl, won the PBN Photography Book Now Best Book of the Year. Now in its third edition, the book was re-released in 2014 by Twin Palms and made Time's Best Photography Books for a second time. And so many awards have gone to Gomorrah Girl. I, I won't even bother Not to. Too Ah, uh, great success, a great event in publishing. Um, his works are included in the permanent collections of George Eastman House, Cleveland Museum of Art, ICP Lightwork, and the DC Bank Frankfurt Art Foyer private collection. In 2013, Valerio was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. His most recent book, I Am Nothing, was self-published in November 2014 and is distributed worldwide by Twin Palms. Valerio's commercial clients include Renault, MTV Italia, Telecom, Levi's, and Warner Music Italy. So please help me welcome Valerio Spada to our lecture series. So I don't use that, I just go without microphone. Okay, hi, Th thank you for coming. And um, I'm not very, you know, in US day, everybody's very organized with presentation. I just have folders of stuff. So I'm going to show you pictures and, uh, and uh, books. Um, so we start with the first, uh, the, the book he was, uh, Jaime was mentioned is, uh, is Gomorrah Girl. And uh, this is uh, the first edition, which is behind a glass uh, in Paris now. And uh, it's nice. Uh, but it started with a total, uh, I don't have the money to print the hardcover thing. This is maybe nice for any probably photography student that, that figure out to how to make a book because I didn't have uh, any uh, uh, probably any idea that uh, the work I was doing in Naples was about a book and uh, about to become a book. I was a commercial photographer before and uh, then I, I met this girl that is Annalisa, the, the, the father of this girl that is Annalisa Durante and. Um, and my life kind of changed and I quit uh, my agency in Paris and I got back to Naples to live there. So then became a book. Uh, so, but this is uh, the cover of the book um, of the first and second edition to the left, which was self-published. And this is the third edition cover uh, that is out now since a month by Twin Pounds Publisher. So I start here because uh, we can even talk about a little bit about design. Uh, when you decide to work with the designer, and, and I chose uh, this designer for, for this reason, um, because it was really good uh, working with different papers and different cuts in papers. Uh, one of the very first uh, uh, discussion I had with the designer for this book was if we have to choose to have a cover uh, with picture. And as a photographer, it was my first book, uh, so I was really into you know, one, a portrait I took and I love on the cover. And a, a graphist, usually a designer, doesn't really want a, a picture on a cover, it wants graphic things on a cover. So uh, we ended up in a compromise we, because we have a picture of uh, a document, which I'm going to show you later, with just a graphic on it. And it ended up in the end to, to, to be a good solution for me and for him. He said to me that I'm going to get bored very soon after a year, he said, if I have a picture on the cover. Uh, right now it's probably a year and a half that we're working on this cover and, and I'm not bored, so probably uh, I was right. So this is how the third edition looks now. And th the cover design in this case is done by uh, Jack Woody, which is probably, Jack is the owner of Twin Pounds Publisher. Um, so he, in a way, protected uh, uh, Gomorrah Girl. So the, the inside pages uh, are just the same, and they are like that. So you just have two different sets of papers. Uh, you have just 100 gram papers at uh, the big one, the big pages, and 150 grams the inner uh, the inserts. The inserts are on a, uh, a thicker paper, and uh, it's very hard to do something like that. It was uh, back then; I don't know if now, but it has to be handmade once you produce the book uh, by people. So you have two different things that you have to put two pages by two pages, and then stapled. We had a staple at the first and second edition. Now Jack designed. Uh, 
this case uh, that protects the, the whole book, which I find to be very sweet and only someone like him can design something like that. The whole story um, started from uh, an accident in Naples, which happened in this street that you see here, and uh, a girl, that is Annalisa, got killed in an accident actually. There was uh, Annalisa and two uh, of her friends uh, and then uh, uh, talking with a young boss then, Salvatore Giuliano. He was 19 at the time and um, she was 14. And two killers came from a road uh, um, just nearby to shoot to Salvatore Giuliano that tried to defend himself hiding behind this uh, blue car that you see here and shoot three bullets uh, back to, to the killers. And uh, uh, three bullets that the forensic police found. So they might have shot more than, than three, but uh, that would happen. And um, one of the bullets accidentally hit uh, Annalisa in the head and uh, she, f she fell uh, on, on the floor and uh, she died after 48 hours of coma. And uh, all this story I, I heard from uh, Giovanni, from her father that I, that I met in Naples. Uh, this is the first picture of the book and is um, on the necklace you have Annalisa, which is the only image of Annalisa that is in the whole book. And, um, and it's the, the, the day I met uh, Giovanni. Wh while I was uh, talking to him, I was recording him, asking him if I can do that. And he was telling me all the details about the murder. And uh, then I clearly was, I was totally staring at the necklace and I say, okay, can I take a picture of that? And, and I just took one picture with the old, uh, the last roll of Kodachrome I shot in my life. And uh, then I, Kodachrome from Italy was uh, difficult because I had to send to Lausanne in Switzerland, I had to send to US and I got back to you in Italy in order to have it processed. Then when I saw it, I thought, okay, this is, <coughs> this will open the book. And that's it, there will be no other image of Annalisa there. And, uh, and it will start everything from the father because I found a lot of dignity in Giovanni to uh, live uh, in the same place where your daughter dies and um, people say that he goes every day at 9 a.m. between 9 and 10 a.m. to the Annalisa grave to bring breakfast still today and uh, it's, a, it's a way to, to be in contact with he's totally sharp uh, in the mind it's just uh, had this one, one hour per day where he go visit his daughter uh, and it was kind of striking and life-changing for me I was uh, living in Paris and flying to Naples to shoot this thing that I didn't know what was. My agent was just saying, this Naples thing going to lead you nowhere, what are you doing there? I didn't even have in mind to, 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 to do a book. I was just to uh, portray adolescents in a dangerous area, which was uh, Scampia and Piscinola and, uh, and uh, all the north of Naples. Um, and then when I met uh, Giovanni, I, I flew back to Paris uh, after uh, hearing all these details about the murder with promising myself to go back there and try to approach the, uh, forensic police in order to have uh, evidences of the murder. And uh, my, my dream as a photographer at the time was to be able to portray uh, the bullet that, that killed uh, Annalisa, and, uh, which is this. And um, the major prosecutor there in Naples told me by phone with a very smart voice. She told me very fast, uh, as long as I'll be alive, she was a woman, there will be no photographer or journalist that will uh, take pictures of an evidence uh, that we took. But if you want, you're welcome to come over, uh, police here in Naples, and take pictures of uh, um, the pictures that we took. So for me, that day was kind of a depressing day because I keep thinking about how those people dress, uh, the, the, the young adolescents in Naples, which is very flashy. There's a little bit was fashion thinking about that, and the contrast with all the details of the murder that the father told me. So to me it was something bizarre to think about it. It was kind of describing my country in a way, uh, especially in Naples, but you can enlarge it to the whole country. And um, so I went there anyway, and they just gave me this Moleskin, uh, like notebook, big, uh, with their prints on it. And uh, I just took pictures with a small digital camera in the police uh, office uh, of the whole booklet and uh, without knowing why uh, I just took it and put it in. Then uh, when, when I, I had like a couple of risky events uh, in Naples um, a bit harsh I, I decided to, to, that I have to end the whole thing. It was just to escape uh, 
to avoid to die shooting pictures because it was not really what I, what I was uh, thinking to do when I was young. Uh, and I was very close in a couple of situations in Naples to that and uh, it was not fun. And, and the night that I really risked my life, uh, I thought uh, I should end this in some way or another. So I, I flew back to Paris, moving my flight three days before. And while I was flying away from Naples, I, I wanted badly to go back then when, where, I, where I risked my life again. So uh, I flew back after a week and I started over again. But uh, with a clear uh, idea about the fact that I wanted to, to, to the thing to become a book. Uh, so I just started to reason to edit a lot uh, and then to reason what I was missing to tell my story, to tell Annalisa's story and the story of all the girls that are living in the same area. And, uh, and then when I was looking back at the picture of this Moleskine, I thought, okay, this would be one layer, the whole thing, try to avoid to put the, uh, the most horrible pictures about the murder, murder that are unnecessary to, to watch and, and it would be unrespectful to Annalisa's dignity, but try to to, to give some details, like this is, for instance, the picture on the right here is uh, the varnish trace uh, inside uh, uh, the bullet, on, on, the, on the face of the bullet, that tells the forensic police that the bullet hit the top of the Suzuki Alto Blue, the car that you saw there, and then probably hit, hit Annalisa, that's the bullet that hit Annalisa. Um, but yeah, in the end, um, uh, it was really about uh, editing the whole thing and, and put it down in a book and try to <coughs> to tell the story of Annalisa through uh, images of girls that are there now in the same area and try to, to, to do things, uh, good or bad. So I, I'm not judging. I never judge uh, things I picture and portray. I try to document what I see and I, and, uh, and, and I see beauty here, so there. And, and all the time I go there. And uh, th this girl is, it's stunningly amazing. I don't know what you think, but this girl is, to me, is the most beautiful girl on the planet, and so is the cover uh, of the third edition girl. And uh, she cries because uh, she she's a neo melodic singer, which in Italy is a whole uh, career figure, especially in the south of Italy. You start singing to move the audience when you're really young, between eight to twelve to thirteen. In this case, she sings a song that that is called um, the letter. That talks about, uh, that speaks about uh, uh, a, a, a mother missing a daughter because they are far away. One is in jail, blah blah blah, and she starts crying while on call, while, while while she sings, and the audience get moved. Uh, I, I saw it with my eyes, and they start crying. Some of them, and uh, any kind of audience, like Camaro audience or a normal audience, uh, they just uh, start crying. I thought it was nice to portray in that way. And uh, this is another girl in Scampia, Liviana. Scampia is this area where, uh, where you have the major drug dealing uh, area. So they are, my intention was to portray the normal life of these girls, basically. These are um, pictures that I, that I took at uh, Le Vele, it's called the Sales to translate. It's an area kind of abandoned because it was, it, it's a beautiful building, uh, but to me at least, but it's abandoned now. So it, you have only uh, occupied apartments there and you have uh, people there uh, living it out of uh, nothing, basically, not paying the rent, clearly, because they're occupied without windows, without glasses, and, and things like that. But they have childs there. And uh, some of them, at the time, was uh, having uh, drugs on the second bedroom. Uh, and, uh, uh, like, drugs, and then drug dealer come to pick it up and to, to sell nearby. And for this, they are getting money from uh, the Camorra, which is the name of Neapolitan Mafia in order to uh, just have the drugs safe in, a, in an apartment. And uh, they get a lawyer's assistant too if they get caught and things like that. And this is like a typical family portrait uh, that is happening there. It's an uh, 11th floor in uh, Red Sail. And uh, that's it, this is Anna, it's a young girl there uh, living just there. And they just walk, uh, you have stairs that are really ruined because uh, criminals uh, with hammers destroy the stairs in order for police to uh, be not very at ease when try to catch them up or things like that. So you don't have lights, you don't have uh, anything comfortable living there. But you have just the first floor, the basement, you have just needles on the floor because uh, drug addicts used to go there to shoot their doors. Uh, and it's a kind of a horrible situation because it hap uh, Naples is like uh, 110 miles from Rome. So it's not like uh, in another world, it's there, it's an hour it's probably two-hour car from Rome. 
And when you go there, you have just the feeling that uh, they live uh, uh, on another planet, and they have the same feeling too, these uh, adolescents. So they just have, uh, they dream to escape, they dream to go to live in Rome, uh, or, or, or to, to go away from this uh, horrible situation, but, uh, but they can't do that, because uh, they just, they just have connections there, they have the family, they, they just live there. So they, it's normal for them to just go out of their apartment and walk on needles on the floor and then go to sell contraband cigarettes or things like that in, in, uh, instead of going to school. Some of them, not all of them. So I tried to document the, what I think was beautiful for me. Um, um, it's a very dangerous place. This is, for instance, this is the, on the right is my fixer car, uh, Punto, white. Uh, I shot the, the film uh, I shot with my Mia 7, which is a medium format camera, you probably know. So you don't really frame very well when you shoot with that. Um, but I never crop my picture, so I just keep what I, what I see. And um, in this case, I was shooting a video going around uh, the, whole, uh, uh, the whole building. And this guy, when we were passing by car, I was uh, at, uh, with the at, at, the, at the window, uh, you say window from the car, uh, shooting the video. He said, just, uh, I'm going to kill you, put this camera down. So I don't know how, because I have the recording of this. I said, OK, I said to my fixer, stop here. We have to take a picture of this guy. So I, I came down at, and, and I approached him, and um, this is the last picture of the book. And um, they were arguing, the, the, the girl and, and the guy. So I just say, I, I start to say, I'm going to kill you, put the camera away. And, and my fixer, as always in that case, is just light a cigarette without saying nothing. Uh, the fixer is, uh, for the one that doesn't know, he's, is, is the guy that uh, promises you to, to keep you safe uh, under tough circu circumstances. Uh, usually. What happens when you are really close friend with the fixer is uh, not nice because once you stay a lot of time with the fixer, you become really close friends, and then he trusts you. So if you want to push forward, uh, he will follow you because he say, okay, he knows what what he's doing. So it, it becomes a, an unbalanced thing right after when you become really close friends. Uh, so it was that that the case. So we just went down, and in the end, it was okay. But what happened is uh, when I ask, okay, now I'm going to take a picture of you. And he said, OK, just uh, name it uh, the killer of Scampia. And I said, OK, why? And he said, because I killed uh, uh, a man and I served uh, in jail for 13 years. He was like 31, probably. And now I have other two years to, to do for minor robberies and things like that. But just call it the killer of Scampia. I said, OK, I will do that. And the girl was not OK to take the picture. So she hides herself behind him slightly. And uh, I, uh, with a cynic uh, instinct, because yeah, the photographer sometimes has to, to think, OK, I don't have to take this picture because she say no. But I just took one shot. And uh, because to me, that was really, uh, in some way, a portrait of, of my country. Because uh, I don't know here, but uh, when you, s you see very often in movies, in theaters, you, you see the couples. And you see uh, there's always a leading person that will go there. You know, For instance, in this, in this, there's a guy that go there and a partner that will follow there. You never have. In, in, in south of Italy, this is very strong. So uh, the guy here is just posing, very proud, looking at me, like, OK, shoot me now. And, and the girl was hiding a little bit. So I just, I think that that was, in a way, the best portrait I can do of, of, of Naples and what is happening in this area. And when the guy in Naples, in, in south of Italy, got arrested, is the girl that, that catch up and on being the boss. Is the girl that go there and uh, and and, uh, and try to run the business anyway? So it's not like that. Uh, how can I say that uh, fragile as a figure, the woman figure? But it becomes very powerful once the man got arrested. So it becomes the boss, uh, and they cannot make up themselves. Uh, they just go out in uh, uh, like in gym uh, suits uh, in, uh, with uh, horrible clothes because if they make up themselves, it means that they are betraying their man that is in jail. So there are all these uh, small rules which uh, someone cannot comprehend, but uh, they are pretty strong in, uh, in uh, Naples area, especially in, in uh, north of Naples area. So I tried to document uh, that things. And, and, and this is was like the picture that I was mentioning before when I risked a little bit, because at the end of, the, of, the, of this hole, to the left, there are all other drug addicts. They are just as a, in a bar sport, you see instead of a, I don't know instead of a cigarette, they have a, a needle on the on the ear. And uh, so in this situation, you have the first floor 
which is where they sell the doughs. So they go up and they buy it behind a cage, behind a cage. Uh, and so they sell the drugs there. And, um, uh, and then they take the drugs and they go down and they shoot the doughs. And then they go up and up and down again. So before entering and take picture here with the fixer, we, have, we had to ask to the area boss if we can do that, because it would, be, uh, it would meant uh, to stop their business in a way if we make a mess with flashes or lights or stuff like that. So we say just don't use flashes and uh, if you can don't take a picture but you can have a look. You just go there and have a look. Just if they, if you stop uh, my business I'm gonna kill you before they do. So try not to mess things up. So I just went there. In my mind I was still like a fashion photographer. So when you're a fashion photographer things are a bit easier because it's you and other 20 people that does what you're supposed to do and then if you uh, messed up something you have somebody like Andrea fixing the whole thing in retouching after so it's another world and uh, I came from that world so to me it was like wonderful there's this girl that I was following uh, outside that I spoke to her before um, my fixer told me okay just give her money and then we take her as I do with other photographers and we carry her out of this uh, place uh, and you shoot the picture uh, safe and I thought uh, it was a bit strange to pay somebody to so she shoot drugs uh, in her vein and I take my pictures. Uh, to me it was a bit, uh, it was not okay. So I said, no, we go inside. We don't shoot pictures. We just look at uh, what, what's happening there. So we went there and it was just this whole, uh, the, the white dot that you see down there is the where the lights come from in, this, in places like that. And she has one over her head here and there's another one over this guy's head used to be an ex-kindergarten and um, so clearly when they shoot they just put themselves uh, right under the, the light where you have uh, when you can see the vein and uh, and to me there was a picture and I took out a digital camera that I had in my pocket and I shoot the picture without thinking about the viewfinder will start illuminating the whole thing because I didn't turn it off and so everybody were aware of the fact that I was shooting the picture that they put guns, uh, my fixer said, should I have to take the gun? Uh, and there were like a hundred people. So f like eight, five uh, to eight of them follow us out of this place. Uh, but once we were out, the, the boss, area boss came to kick them and to punch them. So they just fell on the floor and they uh, stand up again. It's like zombies. So they just come to you and they start to argue with me. You shot a picture, you're gonna show it on the television and things like that. And I say, you did a video, they say, and I say, I, I did not. I, I mean, I just shot a picture and you are not in it, I was saying. I was trying to reason as you normally reason with people, but those uh, people, they don't uh, reason much. So they have their idea and they go there until they, they, they uh, so they wanted the car clearly. The car was the first thing that I hide uh, once I shot the picture. So I have just, a, that's why very often I go around with very cheap cameras when I shoot these kind of things, like a $100 camera, $200 camera, $1,000 <coughs> camera, because I know that something can happen and if they steal uh, my camera is fine. Um, or $20 flashes, you know, the Vivitar plastic uh, old one. And, uh, and that's it. So I will probably move to the, I am nothing to the second book now. So the, the, the second work, uh, which is, is going to be out now in, uh, in March, probably, uh, it's uh, I Am Nothing. And this, is, uh, this was supposed to be the cover, because I'm changing it. But it was the first cover. I mean, we, I already printed this book and already sold uh, some, edition, some uh, copies of this book, uh, but I was not happy with it, so I'm reprinting it with Twin Palms. And Jack is designing the whole uh, cover jacket, uh, and uh, uh, which will run which will be printed on transparent paper and run uh, throughout the whole uh, book and it will be this. Uh, the book is about, uh, <coughs> so you don't see nothing on the cover, which I love, and the title I Am Nothing uh, comes from a, a letter of uh, Matteo Messina Denaro, which is a fugitive from law. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, <sighs> it's very good. The guy, uh, Jack is amazing. Um, so in this case, we, uh, I tried to approach Sicily, which is, uh, as Naples, is a, a wonderful uh, area, territory, and island in south of uh, Italy. I don't know how many of you have been there, but uh, just go there if you can. Um, and, it's, uh, and again, it was a contrast, uh, once again. It was uh, the most beautiful land I can imagine, 
uh, ruled and reigned by the most uh, mean, the meanest person you can find probably around. Uh, Matteo Sinadenaro is uh, once uh, every two, three years in the top ten of FBI Most Wanted. He's fugitive from law since uh, uh, 1993, and he's, uh, he has probably many life sentences on his head. Uh, um, he killed uh, a lot of people. There's a, there's a phrase that I um, recorded about him that was saying, I can build a cemetery of, of, about how many people I killed in my life. So he did things. And uh, the, the title, uh, actually comes from uh, this uh, letter. It's a, a pizzino. A pizzino is um, a, a, paper, a A4 paper, imagine, and um, written, uh, in this case, by hand or with a typewriter machine by the boss uh, fugitive from law. And it's how Sicilian Mafia communicates nowadays and in the last 20 years. Matteo Messina-Denaro writes wonderfully well. I mean, he really writes in a, a poetic way. Okay, I'm gonna read it for, for the far away. You see, I've known pure desperation and I've been alone. I've been experienced uh, hell and I've been alone. I have fallen many, many times and I've got back up again on my own. I have witnessed pure ingratitude on the part of everyone and anyone and I've been alone. I have known the taste of dust and in my solitude I've been nourished by it. Can a man who has lived all, this, uh, all, all of this in silence still have fate? I am nothing, this uh, from the title. A loser, but if you need this nothing, I'm always here for you, for anything that is not rhetoric. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I really love you. We last in esteem, and love is always. P.S. When you have read this letter, burn it. Uh, Matteo Messiaenaro is, uh, is not how he signed his uh, pizzini. It was Alessio, but it was too complicated to. I had a uh, kind of big discussion with the publisher because uh, clearly he wants to explain as much as possible about this to U.S. Uh, to U.S. market and worldwide, uh, and I am on. On the other side, I want to say the less uh, I can about that. So, and still, the book is about something you don't see because to make a book on how uh, a mafia boss rules uh, uh, the, the the country is kind of an impossible uh, challenge. But uh, I try to document again uh, the life in Sicily and and try to chase uh, uh, all the objects uh, left behind by the the fugitives. And uh, I got lucky enough to have access to these uh, objects. Um, the prosecutor called me and say, if you fly to Palermo, I'm going to open the safe for you and, and see what's inside, what we, what we seized to the, to the fugitive, to Bernardo Provenzano. Uh, so I went there in, uh, in one day in Palermo, and, uh, and it was uh, in a very like, secret uh, room. Well, um, we took, picture of, we took pictures of these objects. So it's very, pretty simple. I went out even with a journalist, Italian journalist that wrote two books about Bernardo Provenzano. Uh, and when he found himself uh, uh, in front of this, which is the Holy Bible of Bernardo Provenzano, which nobody touched and saw, uh, uh, except the police that they got arrested. Uh, Bernardo Provenzano is the boss that was on the run for 43 years. So he was the one in charge before Matteo Messina Denaro. Um, he had the Bible where he noted everything, small things, uh, and he used the words of the Bible to give orders through the pizzini. So every pizzino was ending like a sacred sentence or something, something like that that means something, possibly. So when they got this, uh, this is how it looks like inside. So this is crazy, you know, it's not normal to do that. I mean, and look at how he underlines things. It's like uh, every word. If you underline, I mean, I don't know you, but if I go like that, like one line, I don't do each word like that. So he is alone for 43 years doing that. And the whole Bible is like this. So I was uh, inside the Palazzo, okay, inside a place <laughs> in Palermo to, to shoot the whole Bible, which is uh, 1,676 pages, like that, with an Astroblad too, digital. And uh, with a journalist on his knees, uh, turning the page for me. And, um, I was totally stuck by what I saw. And when he finished the post-it, he started to use the old uh, TDK tape uh, in order to, to sign things or words. And uh, so I was real Then we washed our hands after, because this guy was the guy responsible for the killing of uh, uh, Giovanni Borsellino, uh, jo uh, uh, Borsellino and Falcone, the two the biggest prosecutors in Palermo that got killed uh, by mafia that bombed a whole highway, a whole piece of highway, uh, in order to let explode the car, uh, armored car where he was, uh, the prosecutor were going 
uh, Falcone were going with his uh, bodyguards and in the case of Borsellino they put a car full of uh, explosives um, right under the buzzer of the mother's, uh, the mother of the prosecutor that he was used to visit every Sunday and they, the, w the minute he rang the, the, the buzzer they let explode the whole thing and you have the scene after that is horrible, it's uh, like bodies, pieces of bodies on the trees uh, and uh, um, all the bodyguards got killed, he got killed too. So there was a, 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 a period in Italy, a, a time uh, in Italy, 92-93, where the, tr like uh, when, when you try to, when, when you try to buy something and you say I have $50 and the, some, the thing cost 100 Bergen. Bergen, okay. Uh, basically the mafia was asking to, is asking, still today to Italian politi politics, lighter laws uh, for the, the boss in jails. Uh, it's actually a law uh, that is called 41 bis that say that the boss can only have with him just the Bible. That, that's why uh, Provenzano was using the Bible as a code. And the day he got arrested, he asked uh, when he was in jail, I want, I want my Bible. And the prosecutor I spoke with said, sure, you have the right to have the Bible. And he, she bought a, a brand new Bible for him. And she gave the, the new Bible t to him, say, you have the Bible, you're so religious, so keep it. <laughs> and she has this Bible in, uh, in this safe. Uh, uh, and, uh, and inside the Bible, you have all these kind of things, like sacred icons and, uh, and notes. Uh, and this is another book. Uh, but you have also this, which is uh, the leaflets for Italian uh, parties. Uh, that probably the boss was suggested to vote for in Sicily. And uh, this is a so clear connection between mafia and politics. Nobody saw this in Italy. Nobody saw this. And, uh, and this guy now is in jail, Toto Cuffaro. And, uh, uh, Valerico, and you have a question for you. Yeah. Um, how do you approach the prosecutor and you know, get this kind of access? Or what is, what is the deal in that case? Uh, OK. Usually, in this case, it was easier than Naples because I had Gomorrah Girl first. So I had my book. So the, the easiest way to approach uh, people I'm interested to work with is to show them uh, my work. And uh, if they like it, they say, OK, I help you. And if they don't, uh, they say, I don't help you. But she liked it. And uh, But I guess this, this type of people are, 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 the, are the type of persons that I was mentioning before. Once on the phone, they can tell you if you're the guy to help or not. And she was talking to me the first time, like when I was showing my work, my girl, Naples, blah, blah. Uh, and she had a call and she said, sorry, Valerio, one second. And the call was this, okay, yeah, no, okay, let, okay, he's in Colombia, okay. Let, let do this guy a, a peaceful Easter and, and we catch him uh, with an international uh, order of arrest uh, on Monday. Oh, sorry, Valerio, you were saying like this. So this is the phone call that she handled in five seconds while talking to me, giving me the attention. I say sorry because I just postponed an international order of arrest of I don't know who in Colombia. So imagine how fast a, a woman like that can tell if you're sincere and honest uh, or you want to do the scoop or publish picture on a magazine. So uh, I never intend to use magazines in my life uh, and to work for magazines uh, for this type of pictures. I do it only for my books. And, but in that case, yeah, it was like this. The access was easier in the second. Now, probably if I go with my book uh, under my, my arm, uh, it's, uh, I, can, I can have access easier to anything. This is him. This is the, uh, one of the three images we have uh, from Matteo Messina Denaro. Uh, so he got famous for this Ray-Ban uh, glass when he was young. Uh, and, uh, this is his writing, his signatures over there. And this is a graphological studies on, uh, on the few documents that we have from, uh, from him uh, when, we, when he was at school sometimes, like elementary school. Uh, so just to see if it's the same uh, calligraphy. There's another part of the book that, that speaks, that talks and describes the daughter of Matteo Messina Denaro because he had a daughter while he was a fugitive and the daughter is now 18. And uh, I, I am and I get very close to the daughter, um, but it, it's not something that I can access uh, easy. And uh, the, the prosecutor told me that simply I'm going to die if I'm going to publish a picture of her because it's considered to be outrageous to the boss. So I took pictures of uh, daughters uh, from far away. And uh, 
I try to work a lot on the scans and, and grain and everything in order not to show. Uh, you cannot tell if, it, if it's about hair or it's about another girl or something similar. But it was a part of the book that is dedicated to, um, to gestures that you do, uh, that a girl can do by the sea when, uh, you know, when you go out of the, having taken a bath and, and you go to um, uh, dry your, your feet with the sand uh, to, to let the water go away. And or like putting your hair up like that, uh, if you have long, she has a long uh, hair uh, br uh, black. And all these things are things that the father is missing uh, for his uh, mission, how he calls it. So it's a way for me to say to him, is it worth it to, to miss all these beautiful gestures uh, in order to kill people? So, and this is part, is a part of a very delicate of the book, so I'm not going to show you very much. But uh, and the end of the book is... Uh, Basically, one of the things that were written on the on 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 um, on the, those letters by Messina Denaro were to meet uh, from a boss of mafia just uh, by the sea or uh, near sand when you have uh, people taking a bath and blah blah blah. Uh, so uh, police cannot put spy bags in the in the sand because you can walk for miles uh, talking and they can only get probably the video recording, like this case. Uh, and uh, this is kind of, uh, this is written on the Pizzino, so you have these two men talking about mafia business, like fully dressed, walking on the beach, and uh, you have like an, a kid uh, with a bathing suit coming out of the water, and uh, while the, this guy is uh, speaking about business. And uh, again, all these are, Images of of, uh, of things like that. This is a, a, a canvas that got uh, destroyed in the Florence attack by Matteo Messina Denaro with bombing uh, of uh, Bartolomeo Manfredi. There was another one from Gerardo de Renotti. There are Car Caravaggio's picture uh, uh, painters, and uh, these canvases were right in front of a window that exploded with the bomb from outside, and it got destroyed. Now they got restored, and they have it in the Corridoio Vasariano uh, in Uffizi and. Uh, I had a chance to take a picture of this uh, and to walk alone in the Uffizi for one hour with no audience or visitors, which is a wonderful experience. And, and again, to me, this is uh, something that, uh, that represents Italy very much. This is really Italy. So, so the new book is uh, out uh, in two months. We're printing it right now. So we are just um, uh, discussing via emails uh, about uh, details about jacket and blah blah, blah and uh, papers and uh, it will be out soon and uh, so I will always be attracted by this until it ends so until I end my life probably because it will be probably more longer than that but uh, so that's it thank you very much Time for a brief Q and A. If you want to ask a question, I'll pass around the mic. Uh, speak into it for the video, please. Three, two, one. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. So, for first of all, thanks for speaking. I, I haven't seen your work before. Uh, a lot of the work needs a lot of explanation, a lot of backstory. In the books, is is there this backstory along with it while you're looking at this stuff? Because it's it's very very complicated. I mean, we don't. I mean, in the U.S. we don't have a lot of knowledge of how the, the Gomorrah works and how entrenched it is. And I do. I, the only thing I do remember is when that old boss did get like got caught in a barn or something like that a long time ago. If that's who it was. But other than that, we don't yeah, hear no, any of this stuff. Yeah, that's, that was a tough one. Yeah, I know. That is probably why why my publisher, uh, the distributor of this book, wants to explain that much because it's true that if someone from uh, Andrangheta, which is another in Italy, we are very specialized. We have four mafias, pretty tough. But in, in Italy, in in US, uh, you think about mafia as a mafia. It's like when you say pizza, mandolino, mafia, like the whole thing. But we have four different ones. And uh, so there are four books, possibly, <laughs> I can do minimum. But I have a fifth one, too. Uh, and they're all different connections. So Andrangheta from Calabria is connected to Germany very much as money and uh, business. and. Uh, uh, Sacra Corona Unita is connected to Balkans, uh, Sicily to all. Sicily is so is so powerful as mafia. But uh, uh, when somebody from Andrangheta get arrested in U.S., it happened in New York last year. 
for instance, a friend of mine told me, wow, you see you, what you're working on is happening here now. And I was not, I said, no, it's a different mafia, but thank you for the article. I, I heard about that, but it's true that it's difficult to explain the difference between these things. And uh, so Italy is complicated, but uh, it's a beautiful country. <laughs> So Please come visit. So, how, sorry, just so again? How do you incorporate that into your book? Do we, does, does the reader get that info, or is it just left pretty cryptic? It's in the, sec in the Sicily or Naples or Gomorrah? Because uh, Gomorrah is about Camorra and Naples is about Mafia. So in, Na in, in Naples, we have captions which are pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it's written, something what you see. But it's pretty much left. Uh, you have uh, the first and second page is uh, the actual translation in English of the forensic police reports of the murder, which is not Italian. It's a different language. If you read it in Italy, in Italian, it's not even Italian. It's a whole uh, how the police uh, write about a murder is not it's not a language. It's uh, another. It's like I don't know to even to translate. It was a difficult even to translate because uh, to say that a bullet hit the head, they say a tinto la teca cranica. But to translate is uh, the bullet reach the box, uh, sc the school box of the, is all these uh, things that even to translate was difficult. So I translated with a judiciary uh, translator, the, the coldest I can. So it's not even English uh, because it was not even Italian. It was another problem. So you read these two things, which is the report of the murder, and then you open the book. And to me, you don't even need the caption, to me. But then uh, we made caption of the portrait, but anything about uh, the Moleskine murder, you clearly understand what it's about. And I tend to not explain things in uh, pictures and books uh, I make. I'm okay saying uh, nothing. I am nothing, uh, really, and, and to say nothing. That's, uh, but I'm okay, I'm okay now because I did a successful book, the first book, so I know that probably people that have bought my first book uh, that been sold out twice uh, and probably third time will probably buy another book of mine. So I'm, I'm okay because I have uh, uh, people that are nice enough to, to buy my books now. And uh, so I can I can even say very little, but the publisher no. The publisher wants to say the the distributor wants to explain things, uh, and so we try to mix it up. And uh, you will uh, in this case uh, in the Sicily book I solve it without saying nothing for the whole book uh, except the translation of the thing that I read you, and um, uh, we don't have the old Pizzino translated, which is going to be in the end papers. I have it that in Italian. I don't want to translate it but I translated for them. Uh, and then in the last three pages, you have captions of every pages <coughs> where, you where I explain everything I say to you about, let's say, this picture. I say it in like uh, seven lines what it's about. So again, I leave uh, 140 pages of uh, guessing. And then if you want and you have the time, you, you go and figure what it's about. So this is how I, I narrate now, but uh, uh, I, I guess, I'm, I'm going to get worse the, the older I get. I want to tell even less. <laughs> so, and to get away from people, the more, <laughs> I don't know. I'm on this uh, deriva, I don't know to say. I'm going there now. But uh, you have to see the book, and you tell me what it's about. <laughs> Give me back the money. Thank you. <laughs>